Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that definitely made my stomach turn while I was researching it. It's truly a devastating case that never should have happened, but it did and now we're just left with so many unanswered questions. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Native. As you guys know by now, Native is one of my favorite sponsors on this channel. I've been using their products for years now and they never fail to impress me. I love Native because it's always so important to me to be aware of what I'm putting in and on my body. Their deodorants are always aluminum-free, paraben-free, vegan, and cruelty-free with familiar ingredients like shea butter and coconut oil. Native's plastic-free deodorant comes in new and improved 100% plastic-free, earth-friendly packaging, and Native is committed to sourcing their paper from responsibly managed forests. Plus, for every plastic-free deodorant you purchase, you can save 37 grams of single-use plastic. Using the same amazing formula as their regular deodorant, it still goes goes on smooth as butter and it dries very quickly basically as soon as you put it on and it lasts literally all day from the time that I wake up in the morning I take my dog on a walk I have you know my 8 to 11 hour days where I'm working with children all day sometimes I come home at lunch and walk my dog and then I work out after work and somehow by the time I get home I'm still smelling fresh the scents that I have are lavender and rose which if you're a regular viewer of this channel you know how obsessed I am with this scent if I had one scent to wear forever, it would definitely be this one. Then I also have this lilac and white tea, which is definitely getting up there to be one of my favorites. It's also got a floral smell, but just this little bit of soapy fresh smell as well. I absolutely love this one. And then I have another amazing smell, Cotton and Lily. This one reminds me of a powdery everyday scent. This is one of their sensitive deodorants, which means that it's made without baking soda. I absolutely love the variety Native has and how many scents they have to choose from. Native now has their special holiday collection. Native's new Naughty and Nice collection comes with scents like Spiked Eggnog and Candy Cane. These are the perfect scents to get you in the mood for the holiday season. Now, normally, three plastic-free deodorants go for $39. But if you use my link down below and use code RACHELSHANNON12, you can get them for $26, which is 33% off. Also with my code, you can get 20% off of any of their other products like their toothpaste and their body wash, which I absolutely love and use literally every single day. So again, make sure you use my link down below and use code RACHELSHANNON12 to get 33% off of your three pack of plastic-free deodorants. Thank you again so much to Native for sponsoring today's video and for your continued support of this channel. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the Lost Boys of Bucks County. This case begins on July 5th, 2017, and it involves the disappearance and subsequent murder of four young men from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. One young man went missing, and through the investigation into his disappearance, it was discovered that three additional young men were missing and ultimately all four of their bodies were found. As we do with all of the videos that we discuss here on this channel, I want to discuss each young man and who they were as people, what they liked to do, what they were doing in their lives, and not just what happened to them when they died. I will go back and forth with referring to them as young men and boys because they are very, very young, but they are technically young men. So the four boys involved in this case are 19-year-old Dean Finicario, 21-year-old Thomas Mio, 19-year-old Jimmy Patrick, and 22-year-old Mark Sturgis. So the first of these young men to go missing was Jimmy Taro Patrick. Jimmy Taro Patrick was born on May 31st, 1998 in Dolestown, Pennsylvania. His mother struggled with schizophrenia and drug use from the time that he was born, so he was raised by his grandparents parents Sharon and Rich Patrick in Newtown. His grandparents described that the three of them love to joke around with each other, have snowball fights, spray each other with silly string, and prank each other on April Fool's Day. Despite the fact that he was given up by his mother and he never met his biological father, Jimmy was a great kid. Jimmy attended high school at the Holy Ghost Preparatory School. 
While in high school, he received several awards for his academic performance, participated in numerous community service projects such as mission trips to West Virginia and the Dominican Republic, while also playing on the school's baseball team. After he graduated in 2016, he received a $50,000 a year full-ride scholarship to attend school at Loyola College in Maryland. In college, he was a business major, and he continued to flourish in his academics, making it on the school's dean's list. But him excelling in his academics didn't mean that he didn't still make time to pull pranks on his friends. There was one instance where a friend of Jimmy's remembered that Jimmy completely disassembled his bed and then moved the entire bed into the kitchen of the apartment, this prank was just cracking everybody up. He wrote that someday he had dreams of becoming married and having a family, and ultimately, he wanted to live a life where he could give back to others. He wanted to make a difference in the lives of those less fortunate. During the summer of his freshman year, he decided to return back home to work at a local restaurant. Those around him described him as being so energetic, very outgoing, intelligent, and caring. He always had a lot of friends around him, and every summer, he would go back home and make it a point to see his friends as often as possible, and the summer of 2017 was no different. Jimmy was a responsible young man who never really stayed out too late, and if he did stay out late for whatever reason, he would always tell his grandparents when he got home. Even if they had already gone to bed and they were sleeping, Jimmy would wake them up to let them know that he had made it home. On July 5th, 2017, at around 6 p.m., Jimmy told his grandparents that he was going to be going to Chick-fil-A with some friends that evening, saying that he would return back home in a couple of hours. He hugged his grandmother, and they exchanged their I love yous, and then he went out into the garage and hugged his grandfather before he left. He then was picked up by a friend, and he left the home. However, hours passed, and Jimmy was not returning back home. But his grandparents were not too concerned at this point. They figured that maybe he just decided to stay out a little bit later with friends than he originally expected. When they went to bed that night and he still hadn't returned home, they were starting to get more worried. They had been texting him to see where he was and they were getting no response. Sharon was so concerned that at 2 a.m. on that night or going into July 6th, she peeked into Jimmy's bedroom to see if he had made it home that night and he hadn't. So when they woke up the next morning and they saw that he still was not there and he still had not contacted anybody to let them know where he was, they knew that something had to be wrong. Then that day on July 6th, Jimmy had a work shift that he was supposed to do, but he didn't show up. So by noon that day on July 6th, his grandparents did call the police to report Jimmy as a missing person. But as you can expect, when they first called, police told them that they needed to wait the full 24 hours before they could report him as missing, which we know isn't totally true. But even though they were frustrated that, you know, it was only a couple of hours before the 24-hour mark, but they still decided to wait. So once that 24-hour mark hit and he still hadn't returned home, they reported him again as a missing person. Once again, during the initial stages of this, police told them that he's 19 years old, he's a teenage boy, and he's probably just out there with his girlfriend somewhere just messing around and that he'll be home shortly. Now, the whole time, the police didn't quite get the full picture of what was going on. They were under the impression that Jimmy had taken his car and drove off somewhere with his girlfriend, but his grandparents told them that his car was still in the driveway and that his girlfriend had not heard from him. So police took this a little bit more seriously, so they came over to the house and took down their report. Then police ended up pinging at Jimmy's cell phone location. It turned out that his phone had pinged off of a tower in Springfield in Delaware County, so Richard went over to Springfield and scoured the area to see if he could find Jimmy. He printed off flyers and just spoke with anybody that he could in the area, including police, and he searched anywhere that he could to see if Jimmy was there. But of course, he couldn't find him anywhere. The next young man to go missing was 19-year-old Dean Finicario. 
I don't believe Dean and Jimmy knew each other personally or had really any connections to one another besides knowing mutual people, which we will discuss more later in the video. Dean Finicario was born on December 19th, 1997 to parents Bonnie Bastido and Anthony Finicario, and he had a brother named Anthony as well. He was born and grew up in Middletown Township. He was described by friends and family as being passionate, courageous, fearless, adventurous, and sweet. He went to Nishimini High School and played on the school's hockey team before he graduated in 2016. After that, in March of 2017, he started working as a cook at the Richmond's Ice Cream and Burger Co. in Bristol Township. Ever since he was young, Dean loved being outside and active. Whether it was doing stunts on his bike or skateboard or riding his dirt bike around, which was his favorite favorite thing to do. He loved wearing his Heelys around, riding the scooter, and he liked snowboarding. He was high energy, extreme, a daredevil, and fearless. He loved going fishing with his dad as well. He was serious about playing ice hockey. He was as fearless on the ice as he was in life. He was always willing to take on the bigger guys on the ice, and he never backed down from a challenge. When he went to Jamaica on vacation, he was one of the first people to be willing to jump off of the cliff and into the water. He was described by those around him as a loyal friend with a huge heart. His favorite quote was from Bob Marley, and it was, love the life you live and live the life you love. He was a non-conforming free spirit, and he just wanted to live life to its fullest. He didn't choose friends based on who he thought would make him look cool or anything like that. He really didn't even care what people thought about him. His mother looked back and recalled a time where Dean came home with his favorite quote tattooed in big letters on his arm. She was so mad at him at the time, but of course, now she looks back and laughs about it. She also ended up getting the same tattoo as him after his disappearance, so it's definitely an homage to who he was as a person. He really didn't care what anybody else thought of him. He truly just wanted to do what he wanted to do, and he didn't look back. He definitely wasn't a goody two-shoes. He had a couple encounters with the police because he was riding his ATVs or, you know, popping wheelies on his motorbike, but his mom said that he was a very good person at his core. His mom recalled that in the months before he went missing, she could see him maturing. He was working 50 hours a week at the restaurant. He had also gotten a new baby pit bull named Ace and he was taking great care of him. Now, on the week of July 7th, 2017, Dean's mother had gone off on a little girl's trip with some friends. On the day of July 7th, Dean and his father went out to dinner together to a sushi restaurant, which Anthony, his father, said that he really appreciated because the two of them didn't really get the chance to spend some alone time together very often. Then, at around 7 p.m. that same day, still July 7th, Dean yelled down to his dad, who was in the basement doing laundry, that he was going to be leaving and hanging out with some friends for the day. His dad called back upstairs and asked him who he was going to be going with, and he said, oh, just some neighborhood friends. He said that he would be back within an hour. However, that evening, Dean did not return back home. Now, this was very unusual for Dean because he would always let his parents know if he was going to be out all night or getting home late or anything anything like that. Anthony, his father, said that he waited until midnight that night just waiting for Dean to return home and he was calling and texting him, but he never returned home and he never responded to any of his attempts to contact him. Then the next day, Dean did not show up for work. Once again, this was very out of character for Dean. He was very responsible and he would never just no call, no show into work. So Anthony knew that something had to be wrong. So Anthony called Bonnie to also let her know that Dean had not returned home that evening. So of course, Bonnie returned home as soon as she could and her and Anthony reported Dean as a missing person to the police. Of course, once again, the first officer on scene thought that it was possible that Dean was just out and hanging out with friends and that he would return back in a few days. However, the officer noticed just how worried Dean's parents were. They had already called a bunch of local jails and hospitals to see if anyone had seen Dean there or if he was there, but 
nobody had seen him. Then after looking a little bit more into it, they found out that Dean's cell phone had been turned off, which again was very unusual for Dean. In addition to that, like I said earlier, Dean was a very loyal friend. So when it came out that his parents reported him missing, his friends all started showing up to the Finicario home to show his parents support and to speak with police about anything that they knew and to help in any way that they could. Once again, seeing just how many people were showing up for Dean really put into police perspective just how unusual it was for him to be gone like this and to not contact anybody. All of Dean's friends showed up to their house or or if they weren't able to, Dean's parents had contacted them to see if they had seen Dean and they were all very, very willing to help and to put forth any information that they could. Everybody was so willing to help in any way that they could all except one friend who was not responding to their attempts at contacting him. This was a friend that Anthony knew by the name of Cosmo. Now, Anthony had known almost all of Dean's friends. They were all pretty close and, you know, Dean's family's home was the type of home that all the friends would come over to and Anthony would, you know, tease the friends and, you know, get to know all of them. So after seeing this guy named Cosmo on Dean's Facebook friends list, he was suspicious. He didn't know any Cosmo and he had never heard Dean talking about anybody named Cosmo. So with that, let's put a pin in that and move on to the next young man that went missing. 21-year-old Thomas Mio was born on January 30th, 1996 to his parents, Melissa and Charles III. And he had two sisters, Gabriella and Faith, but he was raised mostly by his mother, who was a single mother. He grew up in Plumstead, Pennsylvania and went to Ben Salem High School. When in high school, Tom was on the varsity wrestling and track teams before he graduated in 2014. After he graduated, he went on to attend East Stroudsburg University for a year before he took off some time to figure out exactly what it was that he wanted to do for the rest of his life. After this, he grew to enjoy working in construction. Shortly before his death, he worked at a local gas station and near the end of 2015, he met his girlfriend, Laura Lynn. Laura Lynn described Thomas as being a hard worker who was never ashamed to be himself. Growing up, Tom's mother described that he was a sweet, selfless child who wasn't afraid to show his affection for those he loved. When he was little, he loved cuddling up with his mom on the couch and watching comedy movies together. As he got older, he would go out of his way to make time for his family. He made sure to get breakfast with his mom and goofed around with his little sisters. He was loyal and he always stuck to his word. He was thoughtful, understanding, and he wanted nothing more than those he loved to be happy. He loved fishing and going to Philly to visit his girlfriend. He just had this innate selflessness where he would always offer to help his friends or even his girlfriend's friends if they ever needed it. He was respectful, and anytime someone around him had an opposing viewpoint, he always wanted to hear them out and see what they had to say. That's just the kind of person that he was. He too went missing on July 7th. Now, Tom had been very close friends with another young man named Mark Sturgis. Tom's mom said that Mark and him were actually such good friends that they would finish each other's sentences. They really just balanced each other out, with Mark being more shy and introverted and Tom being more outgoing and encouraging. The two worked very well together when they worked together in construction. Now, on that day on July 7th, Tom had been working a construction project with Mark and Mark's dad. After that, he stopped back at his home and had a bowl of mint chocolate chip ice cream with his 13-year-old little sister, Gabriella. After that, he left his house saying that he was gonna go meet back up with his friend, Mark. That next day on July 8th, Laura Lynn, Tom's girlfriend, called Melissa, Tom's mother, to ask her when Tom was gonna be getting to Philadelphia to visit with her. But Melissa thought that Tom was already supposed to be there. Laura Lynn told Melissa that she hadn't gotten a response from Tom ever, which was very unusual for him. They were also very worried because Tom actually had type 1 diabetes and he needed his insulin to survive. So if he was gone for too long, they knew that something very bad could happen to him. So now going back just a bit, 
Just before Tom went missing, as we know, he told his family that he was going to be meeting up with his friend, 22-year-old Mark Sturgis. Mark Sturgis was born on November 20th, 1994 in Pennsburg, Pennsylvania to parents Amy King and Mark Potash, and he had six siblings in his blended family, Elizabeth, Alexis, Amber Rose, Mark, Brooklyn, and Gabriella. His parents described him as a good brother and son and a hard worker, and he went to Ben Salem Township High School. Those around him described him as being a big teddy bear with a strong sense of self. He had always been a bigger guy physically, and he was also emotionally mature, with an innate ability to calm people down no matter what the situation was that was going down. Growing up, Mark had moved around a bit, so he was used to having to make new friends wherever he went. As he got older, he grew a love for playing the guitar and going paintballing with his father and his stepfather, and he loved all things involving Jack Black. He and Tom Mio loved getting into philosophical conversations with one another, and asking questions that really just didn't have any answers. After graduating from high school, Mark spent a year living down in Florida with his grandparents. Here, he actually played guitar in a band. But after that year, he moved back to Pennsylvania, and this is where he started working with his father in his family's construction business. He was known to be one of the least materialistic people that you could know. He was always wearing the same basketball shorts and t-shirts wherever he went. He never really posted to Facebook, which is why I don't have too many pictures of him, and his phone was always dead. He was just a very down-to-earth guy who was loved by everybody around him. Just before his disappearance, Mark had moved into an apartment in his father's home in Pennsburg. Like I said, on the evening of July 7th, Mark told his dad that he was going to be hanging out with Tom after the two had finished working their construction job for the day. So Mark left and Mark's dad went about his evening as usual. Now, Mark's dad is also named Mark. So to avoid confusion, I'm just going to refer to Mark's dad as Mark's dad. So when hours passed and Mark did not show back up home, Mark's dad began to worry. However, given that the two young men were in their 20s, he had to remind himself that maybe they had gone out drinking, maybe they wanted to be out a little bit later than expected, and that was okay. He assured himself that the two boys would show up for work that next day on July 8th, but they didn't. And that is when Mark's dad knew that something had to be wrong. So by now, we have the timeline of when each of these young men went missing. And at this point, police have been notified of the disappearances of each young man by their families. And the police were beginning to speak with each of the men's family members to figure out exactly what could be going on. So now I'll go back to when Dean disappeared and his father started focusing on a young man named Cosmo. Not only did Anthony see him on Dean's friend list and not recognize him, but it stood out to him because two weeks prior, Bonnie, Dean's mother, remembered that he told her that he was getting a ride home from somebody named Cosmo DiNardo. She didn't recognize that friend, so that's why it stood out to her. So in addition to him being on Dean's friends list, this whole thing of him getting a ride from him just two weeks earlier, that definitely raised suspicion for Anthony and Bonnie. So, when speaking with police, of course, Anthony mentioned Cosmo to the police, saying that he didn't recognize him and thought that maybe he knew something. Now, some of Dean's friends were actually familiar with Cosmo. So, they told Bonnie, Dean's mother, that Cosmo actually lived in Ben Salem in Bucks County. So, the family told the officer that they were working with about Cosmo, who lived in Ben Salem. So then, this officer contacted the Ben Salem police, and he was able to get a little bit of background information on Cosmo DiNardo. She was able to get his vehicle information, his last known address, and things like that. It turned out that Cosmo was 20 years old, his family had a couple of different successful companies in Bucks County, his home address was in Ben Salem, but they also had a farm in a rural town called Salisbury Township. Then, the officer was also able to get pings from Dean's phone, and it showed that his phone had last pinged in Salisbury Township. So, of course, it's now thought that 
maybe Dean and Cosmo were hanging out on his property in Solberry Township on the day that he went missing. So at around 2 a.m. on July 9th, this officer and another second officer paid this address a visit. Now, this was a ginormous property. It was a 90-acre farm that was pretty much just completely desolate in a very remote area, so the officers had to drive around and search for any sign of the boys, their vehicles, or anything. The property was pretty run down with a big shed on the land as well as a house. The house had paint chipping off of it and the screen door was coming off. They drove up to the house and they found pretty much nothing. It seemed like nobody was inside and nobody had been inside for a while. They also found that there were no cars anywhere around the property or any people. So by 2.40, the two officers left. But after leaving, the second officer just had this gut feeling but after leaving, the second officer just had this gut feeling about this property. So shortly after the two officers went their separate ways, this second officer returned back to the farm. He just had this feeling about a shed that was located on the property, so he went and searched it. So the officer went back up to the shed and after he got there, he started shining his flashlight towards the shed and he saw that there were fresh tire marks leading up to it. Then when he looked inside, he saw that there was a newer looking car inside. Like I said, this was a very rundown property and it looked like nobody had been to it in a very long time. But this car had just recently been parked in that shed, so obviously someone had been there recently and this looked very suspicious to him. So this officer ran the plates on the car and this car actually belonged to Thomas Mio. Now, as this was happening, Melissa, Tom's mother, had been searching through Tom's room for any evidence that he may have left behind that could point to where he went. That is when she found a piece of paper on his bed with words scribbled on it. She saw the words Street Road and Peddler's Village on it. So by 2 a.m. on July 9th, she drove out to the area, which is literally right next to Solberry. At some point, she did call the Solberry police to tell them what she found and to report that he may have gone missing in this area. But she also went out to Peddler's Village and Solberry Township to search for him herself. She pulled over on the side of the road in Solberry Township, not far from where Anthony had also been searching for Dean. Here, she just started calling out Tom's name in the middle of the darkness. So, at this point, after finding that Tom's car had been found in the shed on Cosmo DiNardo's family's property, Obviously, this was shared with the Salisbury police. So, another officer radioed this officer and told them that they had actually just spoken with Tom's mother, who had been to the police station to report him as a missing person in that area. I also want to mention that Dean's family's neighbor had an external security camera that actually faced the Donardo's house. So, Anthony, Dean's father, went over to the neighbor's house to review the footage to see if there was anything on it that could point them to where Dean went. This is when he saw that a silver pickup truck drove up to their house on the same day that Dean went missing. So obviously, this means that Dean was most likely picked up by a silver pickup truck. And as a crazy coincidence, Cosmo DiNardo also happened to have a silver pickup truck. So now we know that Cosmo DiNardo is connected to Dean's disappearance via cell phone ping and obviously the truck. And now Tom, because his car was found on Cosmo's property. So clearly, Cosmo had to be connected to both of these disappearances in some sort of way, or he knew something about them. So now, during the day on July 9th, the original officer went to Cosmo's family's home. So not the farm that they owned in Solberry, but the home that they owned in Ben Salem. So they knocked on the door of the home, and that is when Cosmo's mother answered the door. The officer told her that they were looking for two missing boys who may have been with Cosmo on the day that they went missing. The officer said that she needed to ask him a couple of questions just to see if he knew anything. But Cosmo's mother said that he wasn't home and that he wouldn't be returning home until later that evening. So, of course, the officer left. 
Then she started contacting different townships within Bucks County to see if there was anybody else who went missing who could be connected back to Cosmo. Because at this point, the officer really only knew about Tom and Dean being connected to Cosmo and his farm. But after doing some legwork to figure out more, she realized that there are two other missing boys in Bucks County, Jimmy and Mark. So, all within Bucks County, there are four total missing young men. So, officers from all of the different townships came together and started sharing notes and details about the disappearances with these young men. So, police were able to get a search warrant because of this to search the entire DiNardo property. When they got back, of course, they saw that Tom's car was still parked within the shed they also found inside of the car that Tom's diabetes kit was still in there. Obviously, this was very concerning to them because Tom needed this insulin to survive. He was very responsible about always keeping his insulin kit with him and he would never go anywhere without it. So, police knew that if he was still alive, he wouldn't be for long because he didn't have his medication with him. So, now let's talk more about Cosmo DiNardo and who he is. Once again, Cosmo was 20 years old at the time that this was all going on. He was the son of Sandro and Antonio DiNardo, and he was the oldest of four children. They were an upper middle class family who were known in the area because they owned and operated successful concrete and construction companies. Cosmo's dad described him as being a hardworking young man with a promising future. They had purchased their farm in 2005, 20 miles north of their home. This farm became a spot for family vacations where they would hunt deer and ride ATVs. They had built eight homes in their own suburban development in Ben Salem Township, which included their own four-bedroom home with an in-ground swimming pool in the backyard. They had also built more than 30 homes in the city and suburbs, as well as a dialysis clinic. They had also built a facility called Bridge, which was a short-term residential center for adolescents in Philadelphia. They also had a snowplow business, so whenever it snowed, they were out with their plows, removing snow from businesses and residents. Cosmo and his siblings had everything going for them, and Antonio even said that one day, Cosmo was going to be the mayor. Cosmo graduated from the Holy Ghost Catholic Prep School in June of 2015. That same year, he was appointed by the mayor to the town's Drug and Alcohol Advisory Board, where he served for two years. But after this, things in Cosmo's life started to take a turn for the worst. By August of that year, he enrolled in Arcadia University, but he only attended one class that entire semester before he dropped out. He also had a couple of run-ins with police after riding ATVs on the street, which isn't a huge deal, but there was one time that he actually got into a one-person accident after he crashed his ATV into something else, and he broke his ankle from that. After that, in 2016, there were incidents of Cosmo going onto the campus at the Holy Ghost Prep School and Arcadia University where he was reported for disorderly conduct. He had verbal altercations with multiple students and staffs, so he was banned from both schools. There was also an incident with a young woman who agreed to go on one date with him, but she would later come out and say that during this day, he made her uncomfortable the entire time. He was really pushy towards her and just overall very creepy. After the date, obviously she didn't want to talk to him anymore, but he continued to harass her on social media and just would not leave her alone. He would text her repeatedly and ask her to hook up with him over and over and over again relentlessly. She would always say no and she was really confused as to why he was even texting her like this to begin with because she had never expressed interest in any sexual relationship whatsoever, but he just sort of out of the blue would be like, hey, let's hook up, and then she would say no, and then he'd be like, let's just do it quick, let's just get it over with, and things like that, and she would always say no, but he was very persistent, and he would just do this over and over and over again. After this, he enrolled in the Bucks County Community College, and he took one class. Earlier that year, though, he was involuntarily committed into a psychiatric hospital by his mother. By that point, he had already had over 23 encounters with the police. 
he had been exhibiting violent behaviors towards his own family members and threatening their lives, and they feared for their safety. It just seemed at this point that his behaviors were getting totally out of control. Now, they did have a familial history of bipolar disorder, so his family thought that you know, maybe he was suffering from a very severe case of bipolar disorder and that this was contributing towards his behaviors. So that is why she had him involuntarily committed. But either way, by February of 2017, Ben Salem police caught Cosmo with a 20 gauge shotgun and ammo in his car. He is not legally allowed to own a firearm because of his involuntary commitment. But after, you know, being delayed for several months, the charges of weapon possession were dismissed. It's thought that it's possible that these charges were dropped because of the family's standing within the community. Again, he had several encounters with police over 23 times, but he was never arrested or charged with anything. And this one time that he was charged with this illegal weapons possession, the charges were dropped. So people think that the reason for this is because of his family standing within the community. Also in May of that year of 2017, Cosmo was involved in a hit and run accident where he rear-ended another resident of Ben Salem and she ended up suing him. So now because of all of this, because he clearly had a past criminal history and run-ins with the police and, you know, being involuntarily committed due to mental health. By the time these four young men were going missing, police obviously knew about this criminal history. So, they thought that because of his behaviors that he clearly was showing he was not a stable person, they thought that it was very possible that he could be involved in these disappearances. So, police refiled the charges relating to the gun and ammo possession that he was caught with that he wasn't supposed to have. So, they went ahead and arrested Cosmo on these charges and then held him on a $1 million bail in hopes that his family would not bail him out. The plan was, was that hopefully he'd be in jail long enough so that he would speak with investigators about these four missing boys. So, police went to speak with Cosmo about these missing young men. When talking to Cosmo, they basically just wanted to get a timeline of when these young men went missing and where Cosmo was during each of the disappearances. Cosmo denied having seen any of these young men on the days that they went missing, except he did admit that he hung out with Dean on the night that he went missing. Cosmo said that on July 7th, him and Dean were in the car, and Dean had asked him if he wanted to do a big coke deal at a mutual friend's house. But Cosmo said that he didn't want to do this, and Dean suggesting this made him very mad. So the two started arguing, and Cosmo kicked Dean out of his car and then left him on the side of the road. Cosmo said that after that, he went to a nearby town in a different town, not Solberry, so a different town, to go to a pond, and he spent hours fishing by himself. During this initial interview, he basically tried distancing himself from the other young men, as well as the property that his parents owned. He basically said that he didn't know any of the other young men, he wasn't on the property that day or any of the other days, so there's no way that he could be involved or know anything about the disappearances. But after these interviews, police left with a bad taste in their mouth. So they started looking more and more into Cosmo and his history and how he could be connected to each one of these boys. So police started looking into the license plate readers in the area to see if they could track Cosmo's movements on the days that these young men went missing. And it actually came back that on July 7th at 7.49 p.m., his license plate was picked up in Solberry Township and not near this pond where he said he was fishing. Then, at the same time, on July 7th, scanners also found that Tom's car was less than two miles away from where Cosmo's truck was. Then, they found that Mark's car had been abandoned about a mile from where Cosmo's truck had been in a neighboring town. Now, like I said, the DiNardo family had this massive 90-acre property that the police were still searching. They went inside one of the barns on the property, and this is when they found that there was blood. They found that there was a huge pool of blood on the ground, as well as blood splatter all over the walls, so at this point, it made it very clear to the police that something horrible happened on the property, 
and Cosmo knew a lot more than what he was saying. During the searches, they were also able to locate Dean's cell phone on the property, so that pretty much confirmed that he had been there. At this point, all of the families of all four missing young men gathered on the property to watch the police search and they were trying to do whatever they could to help them. At this point, it was very clear that both Dean and Tom were on that property and it could also be deduced that Mark was there too because Tom and Mark were known to go missing together and Mark's car was found near the property. However, Jimmy's family, they were still not convinced that he was connected to this because as far as they knew, Jimmy didn't know Cosmo or any of these three other young men. Now, like I said earlier, Jimmy's family was under the impression this entire time that his phone had pinged in Springfield in Delaware County, which is two hours away. However, after looking more into his cell phone record, it was found that this was actually false. It pinged in Solberry. So now it seemed a lot more likely that Jimmy was also connected to Cosmo and his farm, unfortunately. As police were doing their searches on July 11th, Cosmo's family actually posted the 10% of the bail required for him to be released, so Cosmo was released from jail. But very quickly after, on July 12th, police arrested him once again on charges of stealing Tom's car, this time, his bail was set to $5 million in hopes that his family would stop bailing him out. I can't even imagine how that felt for Cosmo's family, honestly. They just blew $100,000 to get him out of jail just for him to be arrested again the very next day. Once Cosmo was back in jail, the searches continued and now police were searching the property with shovels. Now, they were searching with shovels in hopes of preserving any evidence because obviously they can't go in there with big excavators because they might disturb some evidence. But this took them several hours in the horrible 90 degree heat. But as they were digging, their shovels actually hit metal. They also started to get a very strong scent of gasoline. This is when they uncovered a very large metal oil tank. Once they removed the tank, they then found a blue tarp about 12 and a half feet deep into the ground. Once they removed the tarp though, that is when they found human remains. They found the remains of Tom, Mark, and Dean. They all had very significant injuries all over their bodies as well as burn marks, but at this point, they still had not found the body of Jimmy Patrick. But at this point, after these bodies were found, obviously police knew that he was responsible for their deaths. So, investigators worked with Cosmo's attorney to work out a plea deal in exchange for a confession. So, they did that, and in the deal, they took the death penalty off of the table, and Cosmo made his confession on July 13th. As a part of the confession, Cosmo also agreed to tell investigators where Jimmy's body was buried, and he did. He showed them exactly where Jimmy Patrick's body was buried, and he was buried near the three other young men, but he was in a separate grave. Then he fully confessed to murdering each of the four young boys, and he started going into graphic details about how this entire thing went down. So, the whole thing started on July 5th, 2017, with the disappearance of Jimmy Taro Patrick, Jimmy and Cosmo had been classmates, actually, at the Holy Ghost Preparatory School in Ben Salem. The two had known each other throughout school, but they weren't close friends or anything like that. However, Cosmo admitted that he was sort of a middleman when it came to selling marijuana. So, Cosmo told Jimmy that he had large amounts of marijuana that he could sell him, and Jimmy did enjoy smoking marijuana, so he wanted to buy. So, before they met up, Jimmy was told to bring $8,000 for four pounds of marijuana, but Jimmy ended up only bringing $800 with him. So, for that money, Cosmo offered to sell Jimmy a gun instead. But, you know, Jimmy didn't really want the gun, but he sort of humored Cosmo, acting like he wanted it and sort of going along with it, 
So Cosmo handed him a 12 gauge shotgun and then they walked to a remote area and he told Jimmy he could shoot off the gun to test it out. But when Jimmy turned around to fire a shot off, once his back was turned, that is when Cosmo shot Jimmy in the back with a 22 caliber rifle. Where he fell and died was only about 10 feet away from where he would be buried on the property. Cosmo then dug a six foot hole with a backhoe, which is one of those tractors that has a digger or shovel on it, and then Jimmy was buried there, and then Cosmo said that he also buried Jimmy's money. In the confession, Cosmo said, quote, I didn't want the kids $800. I didn't kill him over $800. I wasn't robbing him. This was not going to go good for me. The guy would have shot me if I went to meet up with him and I didn't have the money. This particular deal, I was not making any money. I was just, you know, getting him a good price on a large quantity of marijuana. So we get there, you know, I said, okay, well, let me see, you know, the 8,000, let me see the money. So I, I go to count the money, and there's 800 bucks there. So I'm like, dude, if you don't have the money, like, this, this is horrible. This is not good for me. I said, well, I could sell you a gun. So we get out of the truck, I hand him a shotgun, he goes to shoot it, and I shoot him. All right, so after you shoot him, I go get the backup, dig the hole, you know, set a prayer. Put him in the hole. I didn't want the kids 800 bucks. I didn't kill him over 800. I wasn't robbing him. This was not going to go good for me. The guy would have shot me if I went to meet up with him and didn't have the money. And I did not want to get killed for his stupid ass mistake. Then on July 7th, Cosmo spent $300 on steak and fish to bring to his grandmother's house in Ambler and he gave them the food. And then he stopped at his cousin Sean Kratt's house and picked him up. Together, Cosmo and his cousin Sean went to go meet up with Dean Finicario to sell him a quarter pound of weed for $700. But at this time, Cosmo only had two ounces of weed on him. So Cosmo and his cousin Sean came up with the plan that instead of selling Dean this weed, they were going to rob him. Cosmo apparently told Sean that they could also kill him since it wouldn't be his first time killing somebody. Sean would later say that at this point, he asked Cosmo to bring him home because he wasn't interested in killing somebody, but Cosmo would not bring him home. So Sean said that again, he was not comfortable with shooting someone, he was okay with robbing them, but Cosmo made it clear that Sean was not going to be going home anytime soon. At this point, it was said that Cosmo and Sean weren't even really close. They had just started hanging out together a few months prior, so Cosmo said that he didn't even know Sean that well. He also said that at that point, he couldn't even remember Sean's last name, so clearly the two weren't very close. Either way, after they met up with Dean and picked him up from his house, they drove back to Cosmo's family's property in Solberry Township. Once they got there, the three of them rode ATVs and followed a dirt trail back into the woods. It was there that Cosmo apparently told Sean to shoot Dean, but when Sean refused, Cosmo became very agitated. So Cosmo then led Sean and Dean into another area of the property near the barn with the guys that he was going to show them his motorbike. Once again, Sean was supposed to shoot Dean there in the barn as, you know, Dean was busy doing something on his phone. It was at this point that Cosmo had signaled to Sean to shoot Dean using a hand gesture. According to Sean, he was very hesitant. He pulled out the gun and then closed his eyes and then fired a shot towards Dean. Of course, the shot hit Dean and Dean fell to the ground, but he was still alive. After this, Sean said that Cosmo snatched the gun away from him and then shot Dean once again, this time to his head. After this, Sean said that he ran out of the barn and started vomiting, all the while Cosmo was laughing. According to Sean, Cosmo then went up to Sean and sort of put his arm around him and said, what, you've never seen a dead body before? At that point, according to Cosmo, Dean's head had split open. 
After they had shot and killed Dean, they went and emptied his pockets of all of his belongings. They found that he had a wad of cash in his pocket, a phone, and other personal belongings that could identify him. Then, after doing this, they rolled his body into a tarp. They attempted to use the tarp to drag his body to another area on the property, but it got caught by a nail. So, instead, they decided to roll his body that was still wrapped in the tarp onto a backhoe tractor and then lift his body into a big metal tank that Cosmo referred to as a pig roaster, which was located just outside the barn. As they were doing this, Sean said that Cosmo's father suddenly pulled onto the property. At this point, Cosmo went over to speak with him, but as Cosmo was walking up, his father pulled away and left. According to Sean, Antonio, Cosmo's dad, had another woman in the front seat of the car when he pulled up, which made Cosmo very upset. Cosmo apparently flew into a fit about this and threatened to kill his dad as well as the other woman, so that sort of explains why his dad arrived to the property where he thought no one was, and then when he saw his son walking up to the car, he pulled away to hopefully avoid being seen, but obviously he was seen. So, most likely, the both of them were up to stuff that they weren't supposed to be doing. Obviously, Cosmo's far worse, but Antonio was also up to no good. So I go to meet up with Dean. Why are you going to meet up with Dean? A drug deal. This is pre-planned? Yeah. What's he to buy off you? Quarter pound of weed. I don't have a quarter pound. I have right. two ounces. So we picked Dean up. Now this was a robbery. Sean was gonna, you know, rob him in the woods by himself on a quad and kill him. He did. So we come back into the barn, you know, we're looking at the best I had and when we stopped looking at that, Dean turned around to go walk out. When I went to turn, I just hear a bunch of shots go off. Dean goes down, face down, dead. Okay. I took the gun from Sean and I shoot Dean, you know, I think once or twice. I don't know how many times I shot him. Why, was he not dead? No, he was dead. Okay. But I just, just to finish, you know, just I just shot him. I'm not lying, he was dead. Okay. He was, his head was split, split the hell open. His brain, you, you probably found it, half his brain was on, in the barn. So, after all of this happened with Dean, Sean said that Cosmo received a call from Tom Mio to arrange another drug deal that same day, July 7th. This time, however, Cosmo and Sean had planned to set him up and rob him, but apparently they did not want to kill him. But when Tom showed up with Mark in his car, that is when things took a turn for the worst. So, Cosmo drove his truck by himself and then met up with the two of them, Tom and Mark, where they parked in the parking lot of a church in Peddler's Village. They all got out and talked and ultimately, they told Mark to leave his car parked over there and then get into the car with Tom and then they all drove back to Cosmo's parents' property. Then, of course, they drove over to the property in Solberry Township to complete the drug deal and also meet up with Sean. The three men all got out of their cars and started talking about the details of this drug deal. However, as Tom started to turn his back to Cosmo, Cosmo immediately pulled out his 357 Smith & Wesson handgun and started firing at Tom. The bullet hit him in the back and struck him in the spinal cord. Tom Mio fell to the ground and was screaming that he couldn't feel his legs. As this was happening, Mark attempted to run away, but he only made it about 20 feet before Cosmo started shooting him over and over and over again, completely emptying his revolver. Mark was dead at that point, but Tom was still alive and he was still screaming. Cosmo said that at that point, he was worried that the neighbors would hear something, and honestly, in retrospect, he's surprised that the neighbors didn't hear anything. But Cosmo was out of ammo at that point, so he decided to get his backhoe tractor, and he ran over Tom, crushing him until he stopped screaming. After that, Cosmo put the bodies of Tom and Mark into the pig roaster as well, and then later in the day, he covered all three young men's bodies in gasoline and set them on fire. But the bodies didn't burn in the way that he expected them to, so he left them burning all night. 
Cosmo then used a blowtorch to burn the phones as well as Tom's car registration. They could sense something not right. So when they turn their backs on me, mm -hmm. I shoot Tom in the back, drop him. Mark's like, what the? Uh, uh, he was such a big kid, I unloaded the gun on him. So he's paralyzed. He goes, I can't feel my legs, I can't feel my legs. I went and grabbed the machine, because he's screaming now. I mean, I'm surprised the neighbors didn't hear Why, why aren't you shooting him again? I'm out of bolts. He's screaming, going crazy. Sean's like, got his head in his hands. I grab tobacco, you know, he sees that come and just shuts the fuck up and I just run him over. After that, Cosmo left the property as if it was nothing while Sean waited back at the barn. Cosmo headed to a nearby gas station and he bought about $30 worth of root beer, cream soda, water, iced tea, and a pack of cigarettes for Sean. Then he returned back to the barn and picked Sean up. Then they drove down Interstate 95 and headed back to Cosmo's house in Ben Salem. On the way there, they stopped for cheesesteaks. According to Sean, obviously Cosmo ate his as if it was nothing, as if he didn't do anything, but Sean said that he didn't have the stomach to eat his because of what they had both just done. But either way, afterwards, Sean ended up staying the night at Cosmo's house. They both took showers, changed into clean clothes, and went to sleep that night. The next day on July 8th, they continued to clean up whatever evidence they could. They completely washed out the inside of Cosmo's truck. They then drove to Sean's mother's house in Philadelphia to hide the guns that they used to kill the young men. They also visited with Sean's sister, who apparently had a brand new baby, and according to Sean, Cosmo was making inappropriate comments towards his sister while they were visiting her. The two then drove to a nearby barber shop that was owned by Sean's uncle so that Cosmo could get a fresh cut and a fresh shave. That is also the area where they threw the young men's IDs into the sewer. Then they drove to the Franklin Mills car wash to get a professional car wash done. After that, as that was going on, this is when Cosmo received a call from his mother. By that point, she had just spoken with the police, so now it's all coming together. This is when the police spoke with Cosmo's mother about the young men being missing, and she knew that Cosmo was the last person to see them. So, when she called Cosmo, she was completely hysterical, but Cosmo told his mom that he knew nothing. But according to Sean, this call with his mother is really what led Cosmo to wanting to completely finish the job and completely get rid of the bodies. Sean said that he once again asked Cosmo to take him home, but Cosmo continued to refuse. Sean said that they then returned to the farm and then Cosmo took the backhoe into the woods for a while and didn't come out for several hours. This is when Cosmo took the time to bury the bodies of the three boys that had been burning all night long. After this, apparently Cosmo finally let Sean return home. Sean said that after he returned home, he actually went to his mother's house to get rid of the guns that Cosmo had hid there. He did not want them to be found at her house. Sean said that he did this because he was scared of Cosmo. He was scared for his own safety. He was worried about his sister's safety as well as his newborn nephew's safety and his mother's. He said that Cosmo threatened to kill him and his family if anybody found out what they did, so he continued not to say anything, and that is apparently why he took part in all of this. I shot Dean. I was scared that he was going to harm not only myself, but, you know, I have a, a, a one-and-a-half-month-year-old nephew, got a little brother, mm -hmm. a mother. He, he he made it out, you know, like, you know, you say anything, you know, I will, I will hurt you. You hurt your, um, your brothers, you know, after knowing, you know, what he's capable of, scared not only for myself, you know, for, for others. Now, when Cosmo was retelling the entire situation of what happened, 
he pretty much told it as if it was just a normal story. He shows absolutely no emotion and you can't hear his voice waver one time. He literally tells the story as if it's any other story that happened to him on a normal day. This lasted for an entire hour as he was telling what happened until he finally broke down and started crying. But it's not for the reason that you would think. He started crying saying that he can't believe he did this and that he threw away his life for nothing. Not feeling guilty about what he did to these young men, feeling guilty that now he had to go to jail for what he did. I don't know why I did this shit, man. Threw my life away for nothing. My life's done for nothing. By the day after the confession, on July 14th, Cosmo was charged with four counts of homicide and Sean was charged with three counts of homicide. Cosmo pled guilty to these charges. He is now serving a life sentence because, as we said before, the death penalty was taken off of the table due to this plea agreement. But throughout this entire thing, Cosmo has never admitted any sort of motive for this. He's basically only said that it was a drug deal gone wrong. He did apologize at a sentencing hearing. As he was walking out, he said, I'm sorry to a reporter, but that's all I've seen about that. Now, with this whole thing, it was said that Cosmo was struggling with his mental health. They brought forward a psychiatrist who had been treating Cosmo since 2016 for bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder, as well as schizophrenia. Once again, he had been involuntarily committed to a mental rehabilitation hospital because of his mental health, but once he was released, he was given medication. But still, after that, his behaviors continued to get worse and worse. Sandra, his mother, lived in fear of her life after multiple violent attacks, like I mentioned earlier. But Cosmo psychiatrist said that to him, Cosmo's situation seemed to be improving. He thought that his bipolar disorder was under control, so he reduced the medication that he was prescribing him. But Sandra and Antonio said that even though he was showing these behaviors at home, they had no idea just how violent their son could have been. It seemed that as a result of his mental illness, he sort of just snapped and I guess this is what happened as a result. As for Sean Kratz, he did not accept a plea deal. He maintained that he was afraid of Cosmo and he only participated because he was afraid of what Cosmo would do to him and his family. He went to trial on three counts of murder and his defense said that he was terrified of Cosmo the entire time. The prosecution said that he was a willing participant who willingly helped set these men on fire. The defense said that Sean was an idiot with a low IQ and that Sean, again, was afraid of his cousin. The defense said that he was a meek guy who wasn't the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree. They brought forward Sean's family to basically attest to this and they really went in on how dumb and stupid Sean apparently was because of his low IQ. Again, they literally called him an idiot. But they also brought forward each of the family members from each of the victims to say their part at his trial as well. But the prosecution argued that Sean had plenty of chances to back out or call the police or call for some sort of help throughout this entire thing. At the end of it, the jury deliberated for 18 hours over the course of three days but they came back with their verdict, convicting Sean of first-degree murder and second-degree murder for the death of Dean and voluntary manslaughter for the deaths of Tom Mio and Mark Sturgis. He was also charged with robbery as well as abuse of a corpse for all three, and for this, he was sentenced to life in prison. So, that is pretty much all of the information that I have on today's case. I know this has been a long one, but I feel like each victim's story deserved to be told 
any information that I could find about each individual, I included here because I don't, again, just want to be talking about what happened to them and Cosmo and the person who did this to them, but who they were as people before they died and all of the things that they did in their lives and all of the things that they could have gone on to do. All four of these young men were killed for absolutely no reason. It was completely random and to this day, we don't have any concrete reason for why Cosmo did all of this. I believe Sean's account of Cosmo just seeing all of this and laughing and thinking this entire thing was a joke until it came time to take responsibility for it and he realized like, oh my god, I'm actually going to go to jail for this and now my life is affected. Don't kill me, don't put me on the death penalty, I deserve to live even though I randomly took all four of these young men's lives for absolutely no reason reason, don't put me to death, let me live out my life. I personally think that there was no motive, as hard as that is to say, and as unbelievable as that feels. I personally think that Cosmo is just so messed up in his head. I think he was a very, very entitled person. Not saying that, you know, his family could have prevented this or that they could have, you know, contributed to him feeling entitled, but I feel like this happens a lot with people who are given a lot and aren't really expected of much. People who are just handed these things and told, you know, your behavior is okay. Even though you got caught by police doing things 23 times, we'll take care of it. Even though you harassed this young lady into trying to hook up with you, we'll just take care of that for you. Even though you got caught with guns in your car after you weren't supposed to have them, we'll take care of that for you. Someone who has severe mental illnesses like Cosmo in a combination of being raised in a family who seems to not make him take responsibility for his actions, it's just a recipe for entitlement. And obviously, not everybody who feels entitled, not every, you know, spoiled brat goes to this lengths, but I think a combination of all of those things made Cosmo feel so entitled to just doing whatever he wanted, that this was the result of that. I personally think that Cosmo just wanted to know what it was like to kill people, and after doing it for the first time, he wanted to continue doing it because he felt entitled to do so. I think he lured all of these men to his property with the full intention of killing them. He didn't have near the amounts of weed that he said he did, and I honestly don't even believe that he was this middle man for selling drugs because he didn't even have the marijuana that he said that he did. So I personally think that he just wanted to see what it was like to kill people, and he did it, and now he's paying for it, thank God. I do think that Sean played more of a role than he necessarily wants us to know, but at the same time, I do think that maybe he didn't want to be there. I think that it's possible that Cosmo pressured him into doing this. I do know off the top of my head, I don't have this written down, but I just remembered this, that Sean does have a past criminal history where there was this dispute and someone else was shot by Sean and I think he served some time for it, but it seemed to be like a self-defense type of thing. But I know that Sean has sort of a past criminal history, so I don't think that Sean was this person held hostage. I don't think that Cosmo was just, you know, dragging him along and forcing him to do this. I do believe, though, that Maybe Cosmo got him into this saying like, hey, we're going to rob these guys. I'm going to tell them to bring $8,000. I'm going to tell them to bring 700 bucks, all these different things. We're going to rob them and, you know, let them on their merry way or whatever. And I think that's what Sean wanted to participate in. But then I do think that it grew from there. I think that maybe he didn't know that he was going to kill these men and then once he did, he kind of felt trapped and felt like he needed to contribute I definitely see how that can be possible. Like, hey, Sean, you're now in on this with me. You witnessed this, you know, you're now a part of it. So you need to save your own butt and cover yourself. So I think that's how Sean could have got pulled into this. I don't necessarily think that Sean was afraid for his life, but I also don't think that Sean went into this wanting to kill anybody. Again, I do think that Cosmo pressured him, but I do agree with the prosecution when they said that if Sean really didn't want a part of any of this, he had plenty of chances to back out, he had plenty of chances to call for help, he had plenty of chances to report this, 
and he did none of those things. He could have gotten away with a much shorter sentence after calling the police and being like, hey, my cousin did all of these things. I don't want any part of it. I unfortunately was there, which would probably get him some jail time, but now he's serving life in prison, so he could have called for help, he could have done something more, and he didn't, and now he's paying. I do think that Cosmo's mental illness could have played a huge role in what he did. No mentally healthy person is just gonna go and kill four innocent young men for absolutely no reason at all like he did, but again, there is a stigma around mental illness, and obviously, not everybody with mental illnesses go on to do things like this, but I do think most people who do things like this are mentally ill. I am absolutely so heartbroken for the families of these young men. They deserved absolutely none of this. I don't want to hear any negative comments about how they were doing drugs or trying to buy weed, so they deserve this. I don't want to hear any of that. They literally made one mistake. They trusted somebody who they were just trying to buy weed from. It's truly amazing the amount of effort that these families put into finding their loved ones. I'm amazed by their relentless efforts in going out and searching for them and finding them and being so confident that they are going to bring their loved ones home. I think that in a combination with police actually doing their due diligence is what got this case solved so quickly. I'm so glad that it was solved as quickly as it was, but... Obviously, I wish there was a different outcome. I wish these four young men were still here, were still with their families, and were still going on with their lives and doing the things that they would have gone on to do. But with that, that is where I am going to end today's video, and now I want to know your guys' thoughts. What do you think Cosmo's motive was? Do you think there was one, or do you agree with me that you just think he was very mentally ill and he wanted to see what it was like to kill someone? What do you think Sean's involvement was? Do you think he was more involved? Do you think he wanted to kill them with Cosmo? Do you think this was a plan they came up with together? Or do you think Sean just wanted to rob them? Let me know this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. But either way, if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. That is a brand new form that I created just for case suggestions. So instead of emailing me, I find it much easier and quicker just to use the form down below. You can get all of the information right there, the victim's name, the description of what happened to them, and any other details that you want to include. So please make sure you use the Google form if you have absolutely any cases that you would like to see covered on this channel. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!